said, we, we don't know a great deal about this subject. Um, it hasn't been well researched. And so a lot of it, what I'm going to present, is speculation. Um, uh, but, you know, well-informed speculation. Um, and it's, a, it's a subject that hasn't attra attracted much attention, really. Um, except in the world of pest management, as you heard, I, I do more than just butterflies. I'm an agricultural entomologist. And so I think of eruptions as outbreaks. In fact, when I was first approached to talk about butterfly eruptions, I, I immediately envisaged volcanology or volcanoes erupting because eruption is not really a word used in pest management, it's pest outbreaks. But it's the same, the same sort of uh, uh, hypothesis behind eruptions uh, as in outbreaks. <laughs> so, without further ado, erupt. So first of all, I had to look up what actually erupt <laughs> means. And there's at least two definitions by and large. Um, the first one is, is what I thought it was to enter a region suddenly in very large numbers. But, but there's also a lot of uh, dictionaries have the definition just to undergo a sudden upsurge in numbers, especially when natural ecological checks and balances are disturbed. So, you know, it, it could be either. And so, in this talk, I'll talk about uh, our butterflies, um, the ones that suddenly enter this area in large numbers, but also we have a number that occur here that sometimes become far more common than the norm, if you like. So, I actually thought we would, this wasn't going to be a very long talk uh, because you don't know much about what I'm talking about. But uh, <laughs> as I dug further into the subject, I did find more, so it's a decent level talk. Um, and there's lots of pretty pictures too. So, the migrant eruptions, we really, and, you know, we do have a wealth of butterfly expertise in the room too, looking at John and David, so please chime in if uh, you've got something to add. But I think we only have two migrant eruptors, eruptors um, on a regular basis uh, that occur in very large numbers anyway. I'll talk about some minor ones as well, but uh, these two, Painted Lady and the California Tortoiseshell, are famed for exploding in large numbers. Yes, John. Well, you know, the, the, certainly the pain lady comes to this uh, from another place, comes to our state from another place. The uh, California tortoise shell is resident and it, it undergoes these. Uh, as well, but I mean, I, I think a lot of them do come up as well when they have that eruptive year. I don't know. No. I, that's you something think? to be looked at. Then the other one, of course, is the pine white. Well, that's much later on in my talk. With, oh, I mean, that, that, <laughs> that's not a migrant eruptive. Come on, pay attention. <laughs> you, you described that, that California tortoise shell is resident in the state. The state, we don't have a state, that's a, that's a, that's a boundary, you want to call political boundary. We were seeing tons of those California tortoise shells in western Washington where we have hardly any host plant. When was that? Uh, eight years ago? Yeah, nine? Yeah, I was saying. Do you know the year or years? Uh, you take, well, it's been off and on, but the, the reason is that they, they uh, return to low elevations to diapause over the winter because it's a lot less hostile. You know, they go through their uh, their spring migration uphill and then their fall migration back down. So actually, I, I, I think the California tortoise shell is probably an example of both. I mean, it, it does both. I mean, it erupts, <laughs> resident populations erupt, but they're also reinforced by populations in California coming up as well. Yeah. No? Yeah. Really? Yeah. We'll have to check that out there. I mean, I just remember in my first years in the Pacific Northwest, seeing them moving north in, within Washington, and I just assumed that they'd come from outside of Washington. You'd say that they were, I mean, this is around Wenatchee, they were heading north, you know, in streams. Where would they have come from? Well, I, I can't say where they came from, but there's no, not been a coordinated, like for instance, when there's outbreaks in California, there's not subsequent outbreaks in, in Oregon and or Washington. Okay. You'd have one in Washington, and Oregon would be, you know, like moderate. Oh. So, yeah, really <clears throat> okay, so really, the Painted Lady might be the only one of them. Uh, but we're going to talk more about these in, in species in a minute. And then we have a moth, the white line sphinx, which I think is a migrant eruptor. Certainly it's, yes, I've got a thumbs up from David. Yes, who's the moth expert in the room. Um, I mean, at this very moment, and I'll talk more about these in a minute, um, there is evidence that an eruption is building. And we do have this eruption occasionally. In fact, 
in my role as a pest management person, I have to deal with uh, vineyards being, young vineyards being defoliated by caterpillars of this, this species. So it can occur in large numbers on occasions. And then we have some species that invade in small numbers, um, minor migrant eruptions. I guess it's a, you know, it's a, it's, they're probably not eruptions in the term, you know, in the full sense of the word, but they certainly come along with the painted ladies perhaps. So particularly the West Coast lady is often mixed in with the painted lady migration and maybe the American lady too. Um, in recent years, the Red Admiral Admirable um, it overwinters more now here, but we, we still have a migration up, and I, I definitely believe that one because we've seen them coming up through Oregon and causing actual damage to hop yards. You know, there's so many in hop yards, young hops as they're developing, have been you know, inundated with. Red Admirals been on hops? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. They actually, you know, hop growers came to me with the problem of these caterpillars. Well, it's the same family, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, sorry, the same family, uh, but they're again no. closely related. Yeah, I don't remember. They're, they're in the same group of what we call the vertically rosaceae. Right. But I thought they were, were cannabinoids. Mm, they're they're rosaceae. Um, but hops are in the pot. Hops are in the pot? Yes. Yeah. Hops, hops and yeah. cherries in the pot. Same family. Yeah. Those are on their own. That explains the same <coughs> Okay, and then, then there's the monarch, which you can't really call as an eruptor, but it certainly migrates north, and we, we know that. Uh, so, you know, if we ever get populations back to what they were, there'll be a more significant uh, migration northward each year. And then there's the resident butterflies in the Pacific Northwest that can have explosive or eruptive populations. Uh, often just locally, on the Compton tortoiseshell, you have years of high abundance and then hardly anything for many years. Morning cloaks the same. We, a few years ago, right, they were, they were everywhere. I remember going to field trips with you and seeing caterpillars all over the gorge. And at that time, the butterflies were very common. But now, you know, we've seen one this year. Stuart saw one in Kawishi Canyon, and I haven't seen any for last year. They weren't very common either. So, orange sulfur is another one. And at the end of seasons, they often, around alfalfa agricultural fields, they'll explode and they'll be millions of them. Um, Becker's White is a, an occasional eruptor I've noticed in, in my area and going on from what John said about being green and lush this year as it is on the east as well as on the west and um, when they had this second generation of Becker's Whites um, you can sometimes you know I remember driving on roads around Yakima and every flower on the roadside was just white covered in uh, Becker's Whites so they, they've got the potential to and then there's the big one, as John mentioned, Pine White. You've got a Western White in there, too. <sighs> really? I haven't seen it. Well, it's, it's pretty extreme. Normally, Western Whites are low density all over the state, right? Yeah. But in a year like this year, I think that they might have a big break. Okay. Interesting. Any more? But I, I think that's it for yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so looking at more detail of some of these species, the migrant eruptors, the painted lady, you know, it's the world's butterfly. Uh, it's all over the world. Um, I remember, as a kid growing up, loving butterflies and seeing painted ladies in England and, and thistles just defoliated by caterpillars. Um, so they were invading Britain at that time, and they, they still do. Vast invasions leading to huge populations of caterpillars eating every thistle. I mean, in England, they seem to just concentrate on thistles. Um, but now we know they originate from North Africa. Uh, flying across the Sahara Desert in many cases, um, and it's you know been only fairly recently that we've learned about these migrations. And uh, in fact, using radar in the UK, they detected in 2009 11 million painted ladies estimated, I guess, flying at 30 miles an hour, 3,000 feet in the spring. And later that same year, there was 26 million flying back. And you know, we, they didn't, you know, didn't know that there was a return flight, as we don't really know here that there's a return flight. But this suggests that we probably have a return flight as well. It's just at such a high altitude that we don't, don't see it. Uh, it you know, it's logical to think that the butterfly does the same thing here, migration-wise, as it does in Europe. Um, so, so that's, you know, they are remarkable migrants, and, uh, and the distance there. They're traveling there, 9,000 miles round trip is almost double the one-off migration. So, 
So painted lasers in North America, um, we do have eruptions here in the Pacific Northwest irregularly every five to ten years. Um, and there's some evidence that they occur in association with El Nino events. In fact, we have um, uh, Robert Van den Bosch in the audience who actually wrote a couple of papers about this subject a few years ago, um, linking eruptions with uh, El Nino. Uh, but they also can occur in non-El Nino years. So the, 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 the common factor in the eruptions is the fact that southerly areas of the US and Mexico have above average winter rainfall. And this produces abundant food resources for the caterpillars. And, uh, and populations expand. And presumably, there's more than just, uh, as I talk through this, you'll see that there's always going to be more than one factor involved. Uh, and it's likely that, that this is the case here too. It's not just the fact that there's a huge resource of food for them, but there must be a low natural enemy abundance at the same time. Um, because otherwise, you know, the natural enemies would take care of the population. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think we know so little about eruptions, is because there are so many factors involved, probably, in all these instances. Um, and as I said, we don't know all the, the factors causing eruptions. And because a lot of you know, the butterflies, they're not economic pests or problems, um, there's not much research being done on them. So, so we get painted lady eruptions, and it's been some time since we've had one, haven't it? Isn't it, John? I don't remember. It's been at least five years, probably. Well, we've gotten uh, over the last uh, ten years uh, pretty close to the annual uh, records of, of painted ladies in April and May, and I've, on several occasions, gotten a number of them, and I expected, oh, this is going to be you yeah. when they break out, and nothing right. happens. That's right. They seem to moderate as they get further north, probably because of natural enemies. Um, predators and parasites, disease, uh, mm -hmm. taking a toll on them. So it's been, yeah, I, it must be at least 10 years since there's been a, a lot of painted ladies around. Um, nothing like, you know, in Southern California where there's so many that the roads are sometimes closed because there's so many painted ladies squashed on the road it becomes slippery and, and unsafe. I mean, it, we, we never see anything like that. Um, so an indicator appears to be the floral superbloom, so-called, this year anyway, uh, in the desert. Uh, and this is happening this year. Now, this this picture is taken from online. But I do have some real pictures from, from this year from my friend John Dayton, who uh, lives in Santa Cruz and a monarch collaborator. And uh, he, he and his wife went on a trip to look at the superbloom and, and kindly shared these pictures. So this is, this is from March this year. Um, do you know what the dominant flower is there? I don't know. I don't know. No. It's a yellow one. Yeah, it's a yellow one. Daisy is aster asteracy. Uh, so there's some beautiful shots he took there. Uh, this is actually the trend of the rain in San Luis Obispo County. Um, so this is, this is food for painted ladies, both caterpillars and adults, of course. There were huge numbers. It wasn't a you know, mass migration, but they were, were present. David? Yes. Question. Uh, Tanza Borrego, which is a well known place for seeing wildflowers, reported this spring the best year in decades. It really was an exceptional year. Okay. But another interesting thing is they've been doing a Swainson Hawk count to go through Anza Borrego for a number of years, and this year was by far the largest. And uh, there were a lot of the white sphinx uh, caterpillars. Right, and I'm just going to get onto that in a minute. The fact that John Dayton also saw the Sphinx caterpillars there too. Um, so potentially we could have a, a, a good season for painted ladies um, this you know, in the next few months. And in fact, there have been reports locally, um, well not locally, from Nevada and Utah of large numbers of painted ladies moving north. You've probably seen one that the enter the Lepidoptera list serves. Um, so there the definitely is a migration building. Uh, whether it continues developing, um, we'll have to wait and see. Okay, so this is my erroneous migrant eruptor, California tortoiseshell. Periodic mass migrations flow into the Pacific Northwest. See, I'm taking liberties with you know available knowledge here. Um, but you know, it's not often we see large numbers. Well, you know, the last outbreak we had was. 06, 07, I think. 
Yes, John. Well, I got to tell you, when I was growing up, my personal trajectory was it was periodic. We'd go for four or five years without seeing any. Then there'd be one or maybe two years where it'd ex explode and be really common. Then we'd go through another uh, four or five years. But uh, from the time of WABA, this organization began, we had about you know, almost a decade long, very, very common and abundant butterfly in this, in this state. So that broke that string. Now we're back to where you don't see very many of them anymore. Um, last year, uh, I observed, I think, four or five, which was a surprise because the previous year I hadn't seen any of them. And, and there were reports in Oregon last year that they were building up down south. Well, now they, they could conceivably occasionally come to you know the state from Oregon. I'm not saying they don't, but that's not what they regularly do. Right. Okay. I, and I was expecting them to appear here, but they never did. So it was more of a local thing down there, more than they'd seen for many years apparently. And this year they're seeing good numbers as well. Good numbers of Calvary and Curtis shells. Where yeah. again? In southern Oregon. Southern, southern Oregon. Oregon. In Bedford. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, outbreak populations of California tortoise shells can defoliate mountain Ceanothus plants. You've probably seen that, right? Yeah, <laughs> big grin on his face. Have you seen the shimmering millions? <laughs> you should have taken a picture and shared it. Have you? Did you take a picture of that? Uh, oh, you, had to, you had to carry a camera to take a picture. Well, yeah. <laughs> I guess it was, it was a long time, long time ago, right? <laughs> So, and, and they're audible too, right? You can hear them. I, I go. Actually, you can hear them? Sorry? You can hear the pupae. You can hear them when they're moving. In fact, I saw one last year, one pupa moving, and you could hear them. And, and it turned out, I'll show a picture in a minute, it was parasitized, which is why it was moving. But, and so also, they wiggle when you yell at them, just like morning clothes. Yes, John. They do. Just like morning clothes, right? So there can be thousands of caterpillars on the Ceanothus bush, and obviously this is from Dave and I's rearing for the book, and they produce large caterpillars, um, inch, inch and a half long. Um, so they have great potential when there's a lot of them to defoliate uh, Ceanothus. But um, in a normal year, like now, a non or non-outbreak year, I think they are largely regulated by many natural enemies. Um, I was excited to find this pupa last year in uh, Northern California, um, and it was, as I was just saying, it was, it, it was, you could actually hear it, it was a, you know, on a twig just a little while away, and you could hear it twitching backwards and forwards, and it drew attention visually too, because you could see the gold flashing on it, and I thought it was a bit maladaptive to be doing that, to attract in things to go and eat it, but it turned out that it was parasitized, and it's full of maggots, so that's why it was twitching because it produced a hundred um, wasps instead of a butterfly. I presume it was, you know, in agony or whatever. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a happy pupa. So parasitic wasps, I think, are probably one of the major uh, natural enemies of this species. Um, but again, you know, it hasn't been researched. Did, have you picked up parasitized pupae? Of this species? Uh, yeah, well, actually, uh, more larvae, but there's uh, not just uh, the kind of uh, you know the kind of flies, but wasps. Right. So it's yeah, it, it's like with all these things, when there's significant control of a you know or suppression of a species, it's it's usually due to more than one natural enemy. It's a whole complex of natural enemies, and this is a basic fact for pest management and biological control. So, so I at least can be confident in saying that. Um, and this is an example of a, you know, a braconic wasp, which is you know, one of the gene genera of wasps that, that will attack Lepidoptera larvae and pupae, just a few millimeters in length. So these, these things are very small. Um, and a single crystal can produce you know, hundreds of these. So, so yeah, that's the California tortoise shell. Pretty on the other side too. And these are, uh, I got this from online obviously. Uh, and if you, you know, Google, John and I were talking about Google earlier being, being such a great tool, but you Google migrating California tortoise shells and you get you know, a climber um, blog um, where they actually, to their credit, identify butterflies as migrating California tortoise shells and not monarchs, because I think there's some online saying there's migrating monarchs all around us while we're climbing up this peak in, in Oregon. So this is 2007, which is, as I recall, the last year when there was large numbers flying over the Cascades, probably coming to Western Washington at that time. 
um, that's where they were heading. They were heading west and southwest, um, and in Oregon too. Um, and since then we haven't seen them, but you just see the dots on the slide there, which are the butterflies flying past. Um, okay, the white light sphinx moth. So there's <coughs> currently hundreds of thousands defoliating and deflowering the super bloom in California, apparently, not just in Anza, Perico, in other areas too, San Luis Obispo County. Um, yeah, they're huge larvae, so they can eat a lot of, a lot of food. Uh, this is a John Dayton picture from this year. Um, they have a couple of different colour forms, and you can see that virtually denuded this plant here. There's actually a dozen, I think, I counted in this one slide. So, you know, it's a uh, hawk moth heaven, if you like hawk moths and want to rear hawk moths. You can find all the hawk moths you like. In fact, they were being run over in the road too, so there was, there was a lot of dead caterpillars in the road, in the roads. And in this slide too, you can see that the characters just, yes. just, yeah, just all around. Um, David, how, yes. how big is that? It's like it's a foot long. <laughs> just the perspective on there. I mean, they, they grow to two inches, two and a half inches. No, I'd say three. Three? Three? Big campus. You have the picture of Beth's, Beth's hand, right? What? You have the picture of Beth's hand. In her hand. Span of the They're actually pretty Go on. There you go. I mean, look. Span in the palm of her hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's much bigger than the adult. Yeah, how big is it now? They're longer, yeah. So, you know, we sometimes get an outbreak, outbreaks here. You've seen oh outbreaks God. here, John, yes? Yeah, you know, and it was really interesting about this genus, which is uh, highlands. It has a number of, uh, of species in the northwest, one which is going to be here soon from further north, the highly euphorbiae, that introduced me to Vancouver, is going to be here. They all undergo these outbreaks. Uh, soon after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, with all the uh, uh, fireweed that came up afterwards. Um, um, one of the highlights, I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, not, not, uh, Gallia, uh, highly Gallia, you know. Not the white light sphinx, but the, you know, the Gallia sphinx. Hundreds of thousands of them. And, you know, it's a, it's a moth that probably, there's maybe seven or eight specimens in, in collections, you know. Yeah, I'll take the same one. Right, and so like, and then the next year they were gone. Mm. And so, like, yeah, that outbreak thing is, is, is characteristic of that genus. Okay. So, I think we can expect to see, I mean, we always see a few of these uh, adult uh, white line sphinx every year, but this year I think we're going to see uh, more than the normal number. And of course, the, you know, we get a lot of reports from the public thinking that they're hummingbirds, because they look like hummingbirds, and, um, not hummingbird, hummingbird, all of and of course the mantids would be happy too, because um, they, they get, when they get wow. hold of one of them, they're, they're set for, for a big meal. Now aren't these white line sphinx active both day and night, the adults? Yes, interesting. So they, um, they call the, uh, something active at night nocturnal, something active during the day diurnal. What do they call something active both day and night? Active. Diurnal. <laughs> Die is already taken. I made them. Oh, I think you did. <laughs> but that's a good one. I want to use the iron. They, they seem to favor uh, dusk, you know, a lot of uh, crepuscular, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. Crepuscular. Crepuscular. <laughs> so, so the minor, minor migrant eruptions, eruptors, the uh, West Coast Lady, you're probably all familiar with that. And often, as I said before, often mixing with the within the painted lady population, except in recent years they've been on their own without painted ladies. The West Coast ladies have been, you know, more common from my experience than than painted ladies. And last year, in my experience, the American ladies were more common than painted ladies. I saw four or five American ladies. I don't think I saw any painted ladies last year. No? Oh well, I, I wanted to say something about the, the West Coast lady because uh, they're a butterfly that is particularly suited to Western Washington in that our mild winters allow them to do their thing all winter long. I have found larvae on you know, hollyhocks and the yeah. 
people's gardens uh, periodically for the last 40 years. All winter long, so and even after uh, a, a freeze, they, they don't seem to you know, mind too much. So they may be semi-resident here already. Yeah, well, I, I think that they're even more semi-resident than the, uh, the Red Admiral, which is, okay. yeah. So that may explain why I'm seeing more of them. Well, yeah, if, if, the, if, the, if the climate change is really a fact, then you know, probably severe winters are less and less severe, right? <clears throat> Except this year, on the east side. Was this severe winter? It was a severe winter for us. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was a below average winter. Um, so yeah, American ladies. Um, they're beautiful butterflies. And I saw a few of them last year. In fact, I think we saw one on the, the conference in the Will Hours yacht last year, a couple of them actually. Um, but all of the ladies probably erupt for the same factors. The, the good winter rains in the southern US and development of their, of, um, of their host plants and causing the uh, large numbers to, to develop. Um, and there's the top side. And then there's the Red Admiral, which, as I mentioned before, with the hops is, is another one that, that definitely comes up in, in a minor way. It's not thousands of them, but they're noticeable, mm -hmm. particularly in the last couple of years in Yakima. Um, they turned up, you know, about almost just before the monarchs turned up, um, quite large numbers of them. Um, in fact, Crab Creek site, they do. Yes, but uh, that name, Red Admirable. Admirable. It's not Red Admiral, is it? Well, you see, there's some people that like Red Admirable rather than Admiral. Admiral. Um, for the reason that they're not really admirals, because the admiral butterflies. Are things like Norquin Admiral, um, so they're not the same genus as that. And so it's sort of a misname. And, and, um, so, you know, it's pedantic, but yes, you Well, I had a similar problem uh, last time I gave a presentation regarding green elephants. <laughs> Why? Well, because they're not hair streaks. They don't oh, have a hair streak. Right. You know? It's a terribly common name. I can, you can call them whatever you want. You can call them whatever you like. <laughs> Some people like to call I mean, I. I I grew up with them as Red Admirals, as you probably did, and I'm not quite sure why I've called this Red Admiral here. I've just got... Oh, it's a pile. It's a pile. It's, 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 it's my tribute to Bob Pyle. So, as I mentioned before, outbreaks on hop, in hop yards have occurred in the last couple of years. Maybe that's a thing of the future. I hope not, because I don't want hop growers spraying for them. Luckily, I was able to tell them they're not going to cause a big deal. I mean, hot plants have enormous canopy, as you can see. And we're talking about when they're this height, the cannabis coming on, so they're very noticeable at that time. But the plants grow, they grow a couple of inches every day. So, you know, they can outgrow any, any damage. And I was able to tell them not to spray, and they didn't. And so, you know, hopefully common sense will prevail um, if it happens again. How tall are those? 20 feet? 20 feet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, then they get to the top about July 4th, right? Yeah. Are, the yeah. hop, are the mature hop leaves too tough for the, for the larvae to eat? Are they well, only on the young growth? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's what, I, that's what I've, I've heard tell is that all of, the, all of those perennial plants that they say are alternate hosts for the, the mess here, it, they only feed on the young growth. So the, the I think you're right. the bee marias and the hops, they, yeah. they, they won't attack the mature foliage. So I neglected to mention is that the when with uh, Carterweed, when the painted lady comes in, especially if it's coming in with large influxes, uh, they will use lupin as their primary uh, open position site. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe my eyes when I first saw it, and you know, I could see these you know, painted ladies laying eggs all over lupin. Mm -hmm. I went back and there was larvae feeding on lupin, they didn't seem to mind. So I think exceptional uh, behavior is also a product of these eruptions. Yes. Well, it has to be probably because yeah, yeah. lack yeah, of time. Do something. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so the beloved monarch. This isn't an eruption. This is this is looking at the sky around an overwintering colony in California. <coughs> It'd be nice if we saw them coming into the Pacific Northwest like this every year, but um, that's a fantasy for the future, maybe hopefully. Um, so they they migrate into the Pacific Northwest, as we all know, but very minorly, especially in recent years, and uh, I have a nagging suspicion that this year might be 
worse than the last couple of years because the overwintering populations were were hammered by late Pacific storms just as they were ready to depart. I think the mortality may have been quite high. There's certainly been no reports yet of new generation monarchs in California. There should be. Although it, today that, was the first one. Are you? Yeah, Ken, Ken Davenport we, we, uh, reported a brand new monarch. Brand new, oh, okay. So it's a little bit later than normal, but so maybe right. because of the cooler conditions they've had there too, there's just a little bit delayed. Hopefully that, that's the case and we will see as many as we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, and they're never going to erupt like painted ladies because there's no winter breeding, obviously. It's just the population that goes down in the winter coming back in the spring. So you know, mortality occurs in the winter, so the numbers aren't going to be you know, huge coming back ever. But, you know, interestingly, people in Santa Cruz could say there's an eruption of monarchs in October when they all arrive. Uh, for the overwintering, they are abundant everywhere at that time in backyards and all over the place. Um, so, you know, monarch eruption in another place um, can occur. So, resident butterflies, so Compton tortoiseshell um, is the first example of that. Resident boom or bust population cycles. Um, again, we know very little about these things, and so it's speculation on my part and other people's parts. Um, but these slides here come from the book, or, or maybe they didn't make the cut for the book, but um, we were able to rear, Dave and I were able to rear these, this butterfly once um, because they were hard to find. You know, it was just you know, a couple of years where numbers were quite high up in the northern parts of the state. Um, they're gregarious during early instars, and then they, they become more solitary. Um, but then then something bad happens. This one here is showing signs of it already. It's not looking quite healthy. And, uh, and that's not a healthy pose too. And so this happened in Dave and I's rearing, um, in my rearing, 100% um, died because this is a diseased caterpillar. Um, the body becomes limp and fat. Um, it just becomes a bag full of fluid, but evil smelling fluid. Um, a foul-smelling black soup I put up there, um, and because of a virus, a baculovirus, which is a family of viruses that, that attack Lepidoptera. Um, you think the genus is nucleopolyhedrovirus, and this has been reported before, and it, it probably is the major factor behind their boom-bust cycles. You know, in a normal year, or you know, when they're not having a boom time, this thing, this virus is probably prevalent. Yes, ma'am? No. I had a Milbert's tortoiseshell larvae do that. Did would you? That, yes. Did would you that be the same virus? Pro well, a, well, a similar or related virus, or, or maybe the same, same, probably unlikely to be the same, but the same uh, genus, yeah. So I've seen that in other tortoiseshells too, mm -hmm. but not, I mean, our rearing was limited, but, you know, in this example, it was just 100%, whereas one was one out yeah. of two larvae and one of them, okay. did, one was fine and the other one I yeah. froze. Okay. So, but normally, you know, in other species you, you will get some, but not 100%. Mm. But this species seems to be very susceptible to whatever this virus is. So it may be the most important natural enemy regulating this species. Um, it's certainly a difficult species to find in, in most years. Yeah. And then closely related, Compton's is a morning cloak, and I think it has probably the same natural enemy, the same um, disease problems that Compton's has. Um, we have these years of great abundance followed by years of rarity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, abundant a few years ago, but currently uncommon. But again, they have you know the similar lifestyle with you know, a large batch of eggs being laid and gregarious caterpillars, and you know and with other caterpillars, pest caterpillars or you know, economic caterpillars, you get more disease problems when they are gregarious because obviously they spread the disease amongst them, um, living together. So um, you know, solitary caterpillars tend not to, you know, if they're living solitarily, they're not going to catch the disease from, from uh, another individual way away. Um, so living together has advantages, of course, for, for protection like this. You know, spiny, massive, <coughs> caterpillars, 
Um, but it has a downside in that disease transmission is probably uh, a problem. Once one person, one person, one caterpillar gets a disease, then you know the whole community can suffer. So I think morning cloaks probably have the same. Have you seen disease morning cloak caterpillars? Yeah. What's interesting about cloak larvae is that uh, we can go to a place like we did you know, several uh, years back uh, and have this enormous number of larvae. A picture saying that. Right, right. And just, you know, it's an astounding phenomenon to see because, first of all, they're incredibly responsive, uh, you know, larvae. And part of that is that they're black and spiny. So, like, they are actually well defended against uh, most things. In fact, a lot of, uh, of parasites and things that would parasitize them, you know, don't mess with them. But the vacuole virus, of course, is something that they don't have to worry about spines, right? right. Um, the other thing about that is that they often will move you know, from an area, uh, not in mass, but you know, where the larvae produce large generation of, of adults, they'll often disperse from that site. So that seems to be a behavior that's adapted to you know, a disease-based uh, mm. uh, life cycle. You know, if you're moving from an area where there might have been vacuole virus, into an area that might yes. not. Yes. So I think you're right that that, 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 that virus is very important. I think so. But it's not just those caterpillars, that many caterpillars, and this is a, the same location at the same time. And so the transmission, this is a western tent caterpillar, so transmission could actually be from species to species too, but really. it's the same virus. Yes. They weren't western. Well, they were they? No, they're Malcasoma something I couldn't remember right now. Oh, okay. And they're okay. blobs, so I don't have to, right? Yeah. Constrictive. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. yeah. Constrictive. But, you know, this was taken in situ. They were suffering from this right. disease there at the time, even though we didn't see morning cloak animals suffering from this disease at that time. Um, it's quite likely they could be you know, affected by other caterpillars. But as I said before, you know, you've got to think about more than just one thing. So, you know, the disease is probably important for those species, but there's probably other things involved too. And, you know, as John mentioned, there are defences with some caterpillars to repel parasitic wasps. So, you know, when John was out there, he'd, he'd shout and the caterpillars would just shake and move their heads, which they do when a wasp comes close to them or fly, they jerk and, and you know, repel the fly, hopefully. Um, but, you know, some caterpillars do become parasitized, um, regardless of their defenses. And I don't think, is this the Malacosoma thing again? This is yeah. The, yeah. So, you know, this this has been parasitized by a tachinid fly. That's the egg of the tachinid fly there. And I don't think these caterpillars jerk or jump or try to evade the wasp. I think that's just debris, I don't think. Um, so, as well as the, the virus disease, they've got to contend with other pressures too. Um, Parasitism and predation. We haven't mentioned predation yet. You know, predators going up and just eating them. Um, so, okay, moving on to another resident. And this is uh, looking through my files and pictures. You think I have a picture of a? Uh, <laughs> I don't. I have a date I set all the pictures of, uh, of uh, orange sulfur. And so this is from online. You don't often get a picture of their wings open. Um, in fact, it doesn't look real, but I think it is. But, so we, we have these periodic late season outbreaks, particularly where we live around Yakima and the Tri-Cities, uh, where there's a lot of alfalfa grown. Um, and it's always at the end of the season, though, um, when you know, generations have built up, and then um, there's decline in natural enemy populations at that time. I know that from being an agricultural entomologist. That's when the predators and parasitoid populations prepare for overwintering, and their pressure on pest populations diminishes. Um, but you know, the orange sulfur is quite happy in the, the sunny days of autumn. We see them flying sometimes to Thanksgiving in warm, warm autumns. Uh, so they, they take advantage, I think, of the reduced uh, natural enemies and the huge areas of food that they have. Uh, and so you can have a lot of them at that time. Uh, but then winter kills them all. They, they haven't adapted yet or changed. It doesn't kill all of them. It doesn't kill all of them. No, yeah. just most of them. Most of them. But it gives the strategy that works because if they have these huge numbers, they're going to be moving into areas like western Washington. We had a population established on uh, one of the islands, San Juan Island, uh, for like four years. 
Really? Yeah. Well, they, they would survive there, wouldn't they? Yes. Right, right. So, like, anytime you have that opportunity and you're able to exploit it, then, you know, that's good for you. Yeah. Um, and there's suicide. They're, 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 basically, there are suicide butterflies. Uh, you know, the adult females in flying in, in Thanksgiving, then their eggs aren't going to make it. No. But it doesn't matter because the overall strategy is very, very healthy. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay, and that is why I've mentioned that already about abundant post plant resources in a spring like this one. If you go to the east side, the, the growth that's occurring now. And we've, we've had, you know, spring only started a week ago. I mean, in fact, our first 70 degree day was the, actually it was today, but it went to 80. So today was, the, so we didn't actually have a 70 degree day. I mean, the first day about the 60s was 80. So now, Growth of vegetation is incredible, just even in our own backyard. The grasses that we don't, the native grasses we don't usually see um, because they usually dry up so quickly, they're, they're knee high, you know, which is remarkable. So, you know, the mustards and everything else, they're going to have a banner year. Antilopides. Sorry? Antilopides. Oh. Satchel. Sorry. I'm the skipper. Skipper. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's going to go nuts. You think? Well, there's a lot of things that are going to go nuts, aren't there? Um, and Becca's is probably going to be one of them, because already, in the limited observation, because the spring's been so bad this year, the, the few places I've seen Becca's, they've been in large numbers. You know, like, normally you'd see 10 in a, in a two-hour walk. This year, I've been seeing 50. And the same with um, what of our, not what of our, the silvery blues. We usually, the sites I go to, see 5, 10, and couple of hours, 50, you know, which is quite remarkable. And, and Tonya had the, the in, in, informed idea that probably because, you know, we had snow on the ground from November, from mid-November, no, was it? Yeah, mid-November yeah, yeah. till just, you know, early March or beyond that, wasn't it? Mid-March, I think. Yeah. So insulation for the pupae overwintering on the ground, they weren't exposed to the 10 degree temperatures or zero degree temperatures that we had on occasions. So they were, so you know, Deckers and Silvery overwinter as pupae. So I think they had a very good year. But yet we had to see what happened to the larvae, but they were insulated too. You know, for white of our blues and overwinter as a, as immature larvae. So yeah, I think it could be a good year for butterflies, as John was saying earlier. And there's Deckers as it is right now, and the canyons around the Appalachians. So. The last species, the pine white, which is probably the most spectacular resident uh, eruptor of all in terms of the enormous numbers um, in a limited, relatively limited geographical area. I mean, they don't erupt away from pine forests, although there's some exceptions I'll talk about in a minute. Um, that's where you see the large numbers in, the, around, in and around pine forests. So, you know, ironically, Dave and I spent many years trying to rear this species for our book. Uh, we thought at one point it was going to be one of the ones that got away, um, but we, we did in the end. Um, we, we, just to find the females was difficult. Uh, and then when we got the females, it was very difficult to get them to lay eggs. Uh, but at last we succeeded, and it took many females and a lot of patience before we got eggs. In fact, I was checking my notes the other day. We got 80 eggs from, just, from 40 females. <laughs> 40 females to get 80 eggs. I mean, most of those didn't lay, it's just a couple that did. And, uh, and most of these eggs died during overwintering. And that makes me wonder if there is something happening with eggs too, because it seems that other people have said the same thing. Egg mortality seems to be very high. I don't know if there's some organism in eggs or disease that affects their eggs. Um, this is something nobody's looked at or even thought of. But, because our experience seemed to be, you know, we tried all sorts of conditions. You know, Dave and I, as you know, were, were very fastidious about rearing this stuff, and we tried all sorts of options with no success, except for just one or two individuals. And so I'm, I'm wondering if there is something involved with the egg mortality. Yes, John? Well, most of the females you're getting are already laid out, probably. No, no, we, we well, some, yeah, some were, but even ones that weren't wouldn't lay. I mean, that was that was down to us. And, you know, and then the ironic thing is we have outbreaks to talk about in a minute where they're just laying eggs everywhere. So you'd think, stick them in a cage, they lay eggs everywhere. But no, um, they were very difficult 
get, to get gravid females to lay eggs. And most of them were gravid, yeah, they weren't laid out, or virgin, they were, they were able, they should have laid eggs, but they didn't. Um, so, it's a bit of a mystery. <clears throat> but, you know, once we got the eggs, the caterpillars were easy to rear, so they are, you know, if you've got caterpillars, you can rear them <laughs> relatively easy. And then the year after Dave and I struggled to get these images, <laughs> they erupted, of course. <laughs> Suddenly they were all over the place, and, and, and all the years of frustration sort of, it was just ironic. Um, so, so none of these pictures are taken from Oregon public TV broadcasting, whatever. They actually had a good program, Field Guide, Oregon Field Guide, on high whites. You can Google it and check it out if you want. It's, these, most of these pictures are taken from that. Pretty good, good documentary about the pine white outbreak in, 2008 to 2012. Uh, so this pine white snowstorm in central Oregon, um, and I don't know how many of you saw them erupt um, 2008 to 2012, but it was pretty spectacular. Um, there's dead whites on the ground there. This is uh, also took some um, borrowed some photos from David Shaw at OSU, who took a lot of pictures at the time. This is Mopey Beer. This is this is a pond in the forest, just covered in pine whites, uh, forming a mat on pond surfaces. And if you look in the history of this, and there is some documentation on this, because people were concerned about pine whites being an economic problem damaging pine forests. So because they were a perceived economic threat, threat, there was more research done on them. So there's more information on pine white eruptions than, than any other species by far. Um, so they damaged the needles. I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, the frustrating years that we had to actually see the damage that they caused in the wild, you know, the, the tips of the, of the needles there that we've been chewing on the end. We've got a picture of the damage here where you know, they strip, the, um, strip them. So there's just hordes of caterpillars when there's an outbreak. Uh, so much so that they cause severe needle loss on the trees. Um, so this was during 2008. 2012 outbreak, <coughs> and this is the grain of a forest by pine white caterpillar attack, and this is all you know damaged by pine white. But interestingly, tree death is negligible. They didn't actually kill the trees. They reduced annual growth for up to 10 years afterwards, so they were you know economically damaged, um, but they, they they weren't killed, um, which is you know they suspected they would be, but but they're not. And so, you know, the concern about them is not as great as it would have been as, you know, if they killed this. It's not like pine beetles, which, which will kill large areas of forests like that. And then, this is a bad picture taken from a plane windscreen at 13,000 feet with pine whites so that, that during that same outbreak. And uh, they were fighting fires, and they, were, they actually had warnings to the plane, to the pilots, to be careful, and I'm sure we can do about it, um, you know, to watch your visibility because of the pine white smearing on your um, windscreen at 13,000 feet. So, you know, they were so many, they were drifting upwards. And I saw that in reverse in the one hours. And those of you who went to the conference last year, you remember this spot because that's where we are there. This is us at the conference last, last July, whatever it was. Uh, in August 2000, Ten, I was at that spot, and I watched hundreds of pine whites just falling out of the sky. They were coming down like snow, literally. Um, they were just appearing out of the sky, and so you know it all makes sense, with, you know, with the the 13,000 feet in huge numbers and then dropping out um, in another location. There was no pine white pine white outbreak in the Willows at that time um, that I was aware of, anyway. Maybe further south, this day. Unfortunately, it wasn't at this one. When you say falling out of the sky, are they falling out dead? No, the light. No, it wasn't at the conference. This was in 2010 that I saw them. They, they were alive, just floating down, but they weren't just flying around. I mean, they were when they floated down, but I could actually see them floating down out of the sky and then just flying around. Oh. And similarly, we had in 2010 and 2011, pine whites raining on cities in the Yakima Valley, and this happened at our place in Yakima too, you know, you go to bed one night, there's no, no, no pine whites in our area, you wake up the next morning, there's pine whites around the pine tree in the, in the backyard. Uh, and that happened to many people, well, the whole area in 
Tri-Cities and, and Yakima, the whole Yakima Valley. So presumably the same thing had happened. They'd just fallen out of the sky overnight. And there were other reports too. I think Bob Pyle actually saw some John. Well, some we people. had an old record from you know Benton City or something. You know that we right. just said, ah, you know, yeah, somebody made a mistake. And uh, you just said, well, you know, maybe not. Maybe that was exactly the same thing happening. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, <coughs> so the history of high and wide eruptions and the certificates, things are, these are pretty well documented because of the potential threat to, to the pine forests and so. You know, from 1881 to 2012, there's been 12 outbreaks lasting on average one to five years each um, in the last 137 years, and average out is about one every decade. Except, interestingly, the last one we had was well overdue, because the one before that missed, missed out one here. Do you remember the one between 81, 84 to 2000? Oh, yeah. It was. So these guys got it wrong there. There's another one, was it? Because there should have been one around 1990-something. Well, uh, again, all of those outbreaks, if you actually look at them uh, as they're plotted on the map, they're not in the same no, place. No, that's right, right. different right. locations. So, yeah, I think, the, you know, you can maybe go out of your way and say, well, they were extraordinarily abundant, but they weren't. Look, what you were just talking about down there in Oregon, that was a phenomenon. Right. Yeah, that, that was, was like, that's nothing I've ever seen in my life. Well, one of the, well it, you know, one of these early ones was similar to that, too. Right. It would, you know, I think it was a Yakima Indian Reservation. It was just, you know, they, they were actually talking about the rivers clogged or the streams clogged right. in pine whites. Well, there's a yeah, there was a report uh, from near Spokane in 1881 too. Right. So That's right, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, we we probably if, if we're going back to the, if we if we had missed one here, we're probably due for another one in the next few years. Uh, you know, 2018. Onwards, we, we might expect another pine white outbreak, um, but you know these things are fairly unpredictable. Unfortunately, for, for the for the forester, um, and of course, so if we're wondering why they're outbreaking, obviously the host plants are never limited because there's plenty of forest all the time, you know, so they're, they're not short of food at any time. So the driver of eruptions, I think, is is likely to be abundance of, of natural enemies. And, uh, and this, this is a pneumonic wasp here, not a good picture, but it's actually on a pupa of a, of a pine white. Um, we've got a better picture here. But it's been named because you know, it's an economic pest perceived to be. So you know, they've done their work, homework and actually got identities for the major perceived natural enemies. So this is Theronia prolopescens, an pneumonic wasp. And at various times during the history of these outbreaks, you know, the, there's actually a document that, that uh, you've probably read it, yeah, that, that documents the whole thing. And, and at various times during outbreaks, they talk about this wasp being super abundant, you know, buzzing around in people's heads. And, and so, you know, which is, you don't, pneumonic wasps don't occur in, in plagues or anything like that. Yeah. So it's obviously, you know, builds up a great amount on the pine white population. Um, and, and it could be one of the major drivers of, of the outbreaks. Um, and how big is that wasp? Um, it's about a centimetre, I think. It's not tiny. It, it's not counting on Tammy? Well, you can see it on the pupa there. So the, the pupa stretches from, from there to there. So it's almost the length of the pupa. If you've got the book, you can check the length of the pupa. I can't remember. But it, it, so it's, it's a fairly sizable creature. It's not something you'd miss. It's not a a micro parasitic wasp at all. Um, and then, but there's others, you know, it's not just the one species. And I said earlier, any biological control, and this is what the pine white regulation is, it's biological control of pine whites, is achieved by a complex of natural enemies, not just a single one. So it's not, it's not just that it, you want it on its own, it may be the most important, but there's going to be other uh, characters involved too. And, and, and this, uh, Ugly beast is, is one of them. Uh, it's a psycho, sarcophagic or flesh fly. And a lot of these flesh flies just feed on flesh, as their name suggests, you know, dead flesh. But there are some parasitic species, and this is one of them, um, that parasitize uh, caterpillars. Uh, and this one has been reported as associated with the outbreaks of high whites. Um, so this, this could be playing a role too. And then there's been various reports of predators getting involved as well, stink bugs. Um, like this one here. But these tend to come in 
afterwards when there's a lot of food around rather than being a driver of the decline in the first place. They're, they're just helping uh, knock the population down usually. Uh, this is a nymph or the stink bug with his uh, rostrum or stylus pierced, piercing the caterpillar and, and sucking the life from a pine white caterpillar. Sucking the just life. Sucking the life. My daughter's not listening to her. <laughs> so it's, a con it's an assemblage of, of natural enemies that are responsible for, I think, the pine white um, decline once they you know, you know, become abundant. And, and then it's the lack of natural enemies that causes the outbreak to occur in the, the first place. So finishing up now and you know, looking at some general principles, of course, you know, these are locusts. And I, I spent early part of my career chasing Australian plague locusts in Australia, obviously. Um, and so I, I see things like this. And so I guess that was my first experience of eruptions. And they still don't know. I and mean, this is a very economic species, obviously, causing vast damage. And they still, they still don't know the reasons why, you know, beyond having rainfall and a lot of food for the um, swarms to develop on. Um, there's very little known about natural enemies, for example. And, you know, the exact causes are not known, so they can't predict when, when it's going to occur, when they're going to occur. Um, but, you know, so general principles are abundance of resources. You know, the eruptions are generally caused by abundance of resources, which are usually mediated by climate, you know, rainfall uh, causing a lot of host plants um, and or lower populations of natural enemies. They're the two main things, I think, that are always behind the eruptions. The natural enemies and abundance of resources. And so, you know, if you think about things like, I just pick this at random, you know, Western Green Air Street. Why don't we get eruptions of Western Green Air Streets? Presumably because their host plant resources are limited. They feed on buckwheat, so you don't get buckwheat everywhere. John's got an idea. Well, actually, sometimes you do. You get it with <laughs> organisms that are rare. See, the thing is that the point that you're making is accurate because the contrary, they're the exceptions that prove the rule. Right. Yeah. But so you will get an eruption of Western Green Hair Strikes sure. in a very small habitat, exactly. like, like, like this year, perhaps, because the resource, exactly. resource is available. Yeah, I take the point. But I guess, yeah, I mean, it's the definition of eruptions and being a wide area, and I'm sort of taking liberties with that as well. But, but yeah, the, the, presumably natural mortality is always high as well, but we know nothing about that, you know, what their natural enemies are, let alone what the pressures are. And then, you know, there's things like cabbage whites. We, you know, some people might think I erupt as I think, was Stuart said, he's caught lots of uh, cabbage whites. But, so, so we don't get what you'd call outbreaks or eruptions of cabbage whites generally. Um, there may be some exceptions to that too. Um, so as I said, you know, the complex of the natural enemies are more effective in regulating than, than just one or two natural enemies. And, you know, some, some pests do have only just one or two natural enemies and, and they can outbreak more. But when there's a lot of natural enemies, like cabbage whites, you know, they got you know, wasps, ants, flies, stink bugs, beetles, spiders, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and they're the things that are being researched. There's other things too, nematodes, I think, as well. So, you know, it's, it's a jungle out there for them. Uh, and most species are probably like this, but, you know, there's a few that, that aren't, and maybe they're, they're, the, um, they're the eruptors. But then, you know, getting really technical, as much as this talk will get technical, we're looking at hairs and lynxes here. So this is classic population oscillation, predator-prey relationship. And so you can see there's a very big oscillation. So at times, you know, hairs are extremely abundant, and then the, the lynxes come up and make them almost non-existent, and then it comes up again. So you get this cycle. So this would be like the pine white, you know, where the natural enemies do a great job of, of bringing them down to nothing, and then they slap it off, and, and the butterfly is able to take advantage of that slackening off, and then they come back again. And so the oscillation is very large. You know, it's either boom or bust. At all. But then, in contrast, okay. you've got. I was just going to say, I observe that all the time in my neighborhood with rabbits and coyotes. I mean, I see rabbits everywhere, and then suddenly nobody can sleep for days because the coyotes are howling and howling and howling, and then they clean everything up. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I see that two or three times a year, sometimes once a year. This year, no coyotes, none. Now, there's rabbits everywhere, and the other night I heard one. I thought, here they come. 
I was wondering. You just said the same thing I was wondering. Interesting. We, we just got rabbits appearing in our backyard. Oh, get too. ready. You're like, here we come, the guys. <laughs> so, this, but so things like the cabbage white, I think, have probably got this sort of oscillation where it's not extreme. Um, you know, it varies a bit more abundant some years than others, but not such extreme because they've got the predators or the natural enemies, we should call it, a whole complex of natural enemies, are fairly stable. There's always a large number of natural enemies, and so it doesn't allow the pest to, or you know, in this case, the cabbage white to, to you know, to out, out rank them, out complete them, out, out, out um, perform them. Um, so that's that's pretty much my simplified explanation. And John's got something else to add. No, I'm just I'm, I'm, one of the things that's interesting to me about the, like I said, the cabbage white. Um, if a, a butterfly is common as the cabbage white has one of these cycles going on. Um, you have to ask the question about like it's near congen, it's like the margin white, right? Uh, is it possible that you know a congeneric, uh, you know, um, butterfly species or congeneric species in general, you know, whether it's left or what, um, might actually be impacted by you know the increase or decrease of a predator on one of the other congenerics, right? right. I'm thinking about the angle wings, and you know, in particular, like um, you know, could the the, the vacuole virus. In a morning cloak effect, uh, you know, a California tortoise shell, or you know, the like. And so, I think what you've done is just added another factor to consider, right? Well, it's true. I mean, I mean, angle wings tend to disappear when morning cloaks disappear, right. don't they? Right. So there could be some overlap there too. Okay. So the ecology of the eruptions is still not well understood, even after my talk, um, and even for economically important species, um, and. And looking at the literature, you know, granted pest mostly, the focus has often been on single factor explanations. That's where the research is there. And so it hasn't really explained things because it's more likely the eruptions are determined by multiple factors that are hard to model, you know, to get proof, uh, to mathematically model and to prove that the factors are involved is, is a lot harder when, when there's multiple factors involved. Uh, and it hasn't really been a high priority for even agricultural entomologists to work on this, really. Um, there's been a lot of other things that, that have taken priority. So, so really, you know, we don't know much about these things, but they do occur. And uh, probably the principles that I've explained have probably got a lot to do with them. Um, but, you know, we, we've still got a lot to learn. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, I will answer them. think so. Um, it'd be a bit hard to control them. I mean, you mean, oh, you just mass review them and put them I, I had a dumb idea back in the early 90s when I lived in Montana, and there was a pasture across the road that was full of thistle, and one year it was completely covered with a lot of it from painted ladies, so I'm going to make a million dollars. And, and, I called the state and asked the entomologist if it would be said, well, you know, the problem is that um, they're, they're probably going to lay their eggs and they'll probably get another generation. But that generation, since they're, they tend to be migratory, they're just going to take off and go somewhere. Yeah. And they won't control the local population of the thistle. Yeah. So he said it probably won't work. And so I just gave it up to the yeah. generation. But that generation, since they're, they tend to be migratory, they're just going to take off and go somewhere. Yeah. And they won't control the local population of the thistle. Yeah. So he said it probably won't work. And so I just yeah. gave it up. Yeah. Yeah. And they feed, they feed on other things besides thistles, too. So yeah. they're, not, yeah. they're not, you know, obligate, obligatory on feeding on thistles. Well, how about the viruses and can the viruses be used? Well, yes. I mean, viruses are used in pest control. I mean, you can actually buy viruses. In fact, a very famous pesticide called Bacillus thuringiensis is, is a bacterial disease. That, and there are viruses that you can um, purchase too. Yeah. Um, so they are used in pest management. Not widely or very commonly, but, but they have been exploited to some extent. So to that, yeah, is something that has happened. 
Uh, you mentioned that this winter you had, it was cold and you had snow on the ground for a long period of time. Um, and I just wonder if people kind of make a note of how the weather conditions are over the year uh, that, you know, maybe I might say, well, it was a cold winter, but not only was it a cold winter, but there was snow on the ground, and maybe that favored the butterfly population, but it was harmful to the disease condition or something like that. You know, just kind of a complication like that. I don't know how you'd even study something that's just, there are so many different things that can affect, and when they all line up just right, then you have thousands of them, and you just wonder, how could this happen? But it's just lining up a hundred different things just in the right way, and we just are inclined to oversimplify it and say, it was a cold winter. Well, it was way more complicated. Yeah, it's, it's way more complicated than that. Yeah, yes, you're right. I mean, there's, there's probably a lot of factors involved that we have no idea about. Um, but certainly the principle of insulation of snow is, is a definitely established thing. We know, you know it's zero degrees, uh, not you know, zero degrees centigrade, 32 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the snow all the time. I, I did work on the owner's little blue in, in Oregon and we measured the temperature all winter long and you know, looking at the graph, it suddenly gets the snow part and then it's a straight line all through the winter. Um, so where the pupae over winter, it's 32 degrees the whole time. And yet, you know, above the snow, it's down to minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, so it, it's a definite, a definite advantage for a lot of things to have a snow insulation. Uh, about 20 years ago, I saw a, a, a Pinley uh, er, er, eruption in the thumb area of Michigan. Any idea where they could have come from? Because this was farmland and there was nothing to support that size of population there. I don't know. I haven't heard much about eastern U.S. painted lady populations. Do they move from the south down there, John? You know, most of the time, uh, like for instance, Andy was telling me from Gainesville, a uh, painted ladies were rare butterflies there. Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't think they yeah. no, so I, I, I don't that's... think anyone really knows. Maybe they come from Mexico, too. <laughs> you know? Well, who knows? Or maybe, yeah, they had high-level transport. You know, just yeah, 3,000 feet up, you know, you got nothing really stopping. No, nobody takes any notice of painted ladies either, do they? So. Well, they're recorded periodically, but mostly like, you know, like that, they had to go for it, and, you know, like this year is a big year. Right. But I mean, as in actual migration moving, well, except in California, I mean, you know, like, you know, they may be returning south in the autumn, but we don't see them, or, or we look in, or people just don't. Well, you mentioned the uh, radar. Uh, there has been uh, one documented radar sighting in Canada uh, uh, in the last decade. Uh, noticing the same thing. I would assume that you did that that's happening all the time. It makes absolutely no biological sense to expand your range to just die. Except if you're an orange sulfur. Yep. Can you tell us the species in the photo of all of the Tortoise shell. Was it just tortoise shell? Uh, that one. The Compton tortoise shell. Oh, the California tortoise shell. Yeah. That picture. It had more than California tortoise shells in it. Yes. Is that what you said? Yeah. Is it just California? No. There, uh, there, there was something else. There was the which, angle wings in there. Um, which, which one? Do you know? No. That 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 photo I, I isn't one of mine. So, okay. so, but I could identify angle wings, and I think there was a morning cloak in there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But most of them were California tortoise shells. Okay. Yes, Do we know much about the the elevations or the heights that they may uh, catch favorable winds, like it's three thousand feet? But what if it's fifteen thousand feet or thirty thousand feet? In, Somehow they just know that it's up there if they can get that high, and then they can just go yeah. 500 miles. Nobody knows. Very good. Yeah. yeah. It's just something not well known. No. Nobody's. I mean, you know, the, the people who worked on that most have been in England, at Rothenstead, uh, with their their uh, radar and stuff. But I, I don't know if they've actually looked higher than 3,000 feet they look at. Um, Wouldn't it be too cold, though? Well, you get to a certain level where it will be too cold um, at certain times. So, so maybe 3,000 is optimum. Maybe, I, I don't know about that. Okay.
Thank you.